The Lottie Project, Jacqueline Wilson, illustrated by Nick Short. Introducing Charlie. I'm Charlie. Don't ever call me Charlotte. No one, except my stuck-up grandparents, has ever called me by my full name. That was until Mrs. Backworth became my teacher. Stuffy Old Backworth is making us do a project on the Stuffy Old Victorias. Can you think of anything more boring? Even if you had an imagination as good as mine, I'm sure you'd struggle. Still, I'm determined that my project doesn't turn out dull and drippy like Goody Goody James. I'm going to tell the life story of a Victorian girl, Lottie. Jacqueline Wilson, The Lottie Project. School. I knew exactly who I was going to sit next to in class. Easy peasy, simple pimple. It was going to do it was going to be Angela, with Lisa sitting at the nearest table to us. I'm never quite sure if I like Lisa or Angela best, so it's only fair to take turns. Joe said what if Angela and Lisa want to sit together with you behind or in front or at the at the side. I just smiled at her. I don't want to sound dis disgustingly boastful, but I'm the one Angela and Lisa are desperate to sit next. Lots of girls want to be best friends with me. Actually, I'm just best friends with Lisa and Angela, but anyone can be in our special girls gang. Any girl. No boys around. Uh, no boys allowed. That goes without saying. Even though I just did. But guess what happened that first day of term? We got this new teacher. We knew we wouldn't be getting Mrs. Thomas because when we broke up in the summer, her tummy could barely fit behind her desk. Her tummy could barely fit behind her smock. You could see her tummy button drew the material like a giant press fastener. When I was a little bit uh, when I was a very little kid, I used to think that's how babies were born. They grew inside the mother, and then when they were ready, the mom pressed the tummy button, and out they popped. I told Joe how I got it all so stuck. Don't laugh. I was very little. Joe laughed. Dream on, Charlie, she said. If only it were that easy. That's my name, Charlie. Okay, my full name is Charlotte Alice Catherine Enright. But nobody ever calls me that. Joe and Lisa and Angela and all the kids at school calls call me Charlotte. Some of the boys call me Cake or Carrot Cake or Cake Hole. But they're just morons, though they think they're dead original. Note the initials of my name. Got it? But right since I was born, all the way through nursery and primary, no one's ever called me Charlotte. Until this new teacher. Miss Beckworth, she was new, so I thought she'd be young. When you get a new young teacher, they're often ever so strict the first few weeks just to show you who's boss. And then they relax and get all friendly. Then you can muck out and do whatever you want. I love mucking about. Doing daft things and being a little cheeky and making everyone laugh. Even the teachers. But the moment I set eyes on Miss Beckworth, I knew none of us were going to be laughing. She might be new, but she certainly wasn't young. She had gray hair and gray gray eyes and a gray uh and house blouse and a white blouse and a gray skirt and laced up shoes with a laced up expression on her face to match. When she spoke her teeth were quite big and stuck out a bit. But I put all thought of Bugs Bunny Im imitations right out of my head. There are some teachers, just a few, who have you'd better not mess with me, tattooed right across their foreheads. She frowned at me with this incredibly fierce forehead and said, Good morning, this isn't a very good start to the new school year. I stared at her. What was she on about? Why was she looking at her watch? I wasn't late, okay? The school bell had gone as I was crossing the playground. 
but you always get five minutes to get to your classroom. It's three minutes past nine, Miss Beckworth announced. You're late. No, I'm not, I said. We're not counted until late. On, we we're not counted late until it, we're not counted late until it's five past. I didn't say it strictly. I was perfectly polite. I was trying to be helpful, actually. You are certainly not off to a good start. She goes. First you're late, and then you argue. My name's Miss Beckworth. What's your name? Charlie, Miss Beckworth. See, ever so polite, because I could see I had to proceed delicately. Your proper name, Charlie Enright. We don't seem to be connecting correctly, Miss Enright. Charlie isn't a proper name. It's a diminutive. She was trying to make me look pretty diminutive. Obviously, I tried to act cool, but I could feel my cheeks flushing. I could. Uh, no, no, no. I have this very white skin that can be a real problem when I get mad or embarrassed. When you have a lot of long red hair and you get a red face too, start to you start to look as if someone's put a match to you. Are you Char Charles? And right, I can't stand it when teachers go all sarcastic on you. A few of the kids tittered nervously. That posh prat Jamie laughed out loud. Typical. Angela and Lisa were looking all anguished, dying for me. I'm Charlotte and right, Miss Beckworth, but I've never been called Charlotte at the school. Only Charlie. Well, I'm going to call you Charlotte, Charlotte, because in my class we do things different," said Miss Beckworth. "You're telling me we do things different. Well, I'm telling you, but you know what I mean. I wasn't allowed to go and sit with Angela. She'd promised to get to school ever so early to grab the best desk, and the one next to it for Lisa, and she'd done it well. The desk." Right next to the window, with the hot pipe to toast my toes on when it got chilly, but all in vain. No, don't go and sit down, Char Charlotte," said Miss Beckworth. "I was just about to explain to the whole class that while we get to know each other, I'd like you all to sit in alphabetical order." We stared. We stared at her. Gob smacked. Miss Backworth spoke into the stunned silence, silence, holding her register aloft. So, Anathy Andrews, you come and sit at this desk in the front, with Judith Ashwell beside you, and then. But Judith, the girl, Miss Anthony protested in horror. Clattery observed, uh, observed, Miss Mister Andrews, said Miss Backworth. And kindly note, I call you Mister Andrews, not plain ma Mister. I would prefer you to call me Miss Backworth, not Miss. But boys and girls never sit next to each other, Miss," said Anthony. "He's as thick as two short planks, twenty-two." But when Miss Backworth forehead wrinkled, he run he re round he rewound her. Little speech inside his empty head and took heed. Er, Miss Backworth, Miss, I don't want to sit next to Judith. Well, you needn't think I want to sit next to you," said Judith. "Oh, Miss Backworth, that's not fair." Miss Backworth didn't care. I said things would be different in my class. I didn't say they would be fair. She said, "Now get yourself sorted out and stop fussing like a little." Like a lot of silly babies. Who's next on the register? Laura Ben Bernard, right? Sit at the desk behind Anthony and Judith, and then I hovered, signaling wild regret with my eyebrows to Angela, who got up half an hour early for nothing. Angela's surname is Robinson, so obviously we wouldn't sit together, but. 
Lisa is Lisa Field. Right after me on the register. So it looked as if we were okay after all. It wasn't really fair on poor Angela if I sat next to Lisa two years running, but it, it couldn't be helped. But it didn't work out like that. James Edwards, you sit at the desk at the back on the left, said Miss Beckworth, with, ah, Charlotte and right beside you. Jamie Edwards, the most revolting, stuck-up, boring boy in the whole class. The whole year, the whole school, the whole town, county, country, world, universe. I'd sooner squat in the stationary cupboard than sit next to him. I thought quickly, my brain going whiz, flash, bang. Aha! Uh -huh. Sudden inspiration. I'm afraid I can't see very well, Miss Beckworth, I said, squinting up my eyes as if I badly need, need glasses. If I sit at the back, I won't be able to see the cup, see the board. Sometimes I still have problems even at the front. So if Lisa Field can come sit next to me again, then I'm used to call her telling me stuff in case I can't read it for myself. Isn't that right, Lisa? This was all news to Lisa, but she nodded convincingly. Yes, Miss Beckworth, I always have to help Ch Charlie. Lisa, but Miss Beckworth wasn't fooled. I'm not convinced that you're short sighted, Charlotte. Quick witted, certainly, but until you bring me a note from your mother and another from your optician, I'd like you to sit at the back beside James. That was it. I was doomed. There was no way there was no way out. I had to sit next to Jamie Edwards. He moved his chair right up against the wall and shuddered and shuddered elaborately in a, as I flopped down furiously beside him. Charlie K. Cool, yuck, he said, but under his breath, because he knew Miss Beckworth was watching. Jamie Edwards is the smartest little slot, swat, swat, and always wants the teachers to have him as their pet, which he is anyway, because he's such an infuriating clever clogs. Always coming top, top, top. Well, who on earth wants to be top of the class? Why can't you try harder at school, Charlie? Joe always says. You're bright. If you'd only stop messing about and work hard, you could go really well. You could come top if you really tried. I asked Joe why she always snagged so about my boring old education. Maybe you're not so bright as I thought you were, Joe said. Can't you work it out yourself? Work it out for yourself, for yourself. That made me feel bad, but it's hopeless. Maybe I could do better. I'm not bottom of the class. Mind you, just a nice, comfy middle. But I suppose if I worked a little stink and I could do better, then I could do better. I can generally beat Lisa and Angela if I want. Maybe I could come top of all the girls, but I couldn't ever beat Jamie Edwards. And I'd far sooner be bottom than second to smarty pants. So I slid down in my seat and sucked for most of the morning. It was hot, but Jamie kept me well fat, waving his hand fractiously all the time because he kept wanting Miss Beckworth to pick him. Pathetic. I wouldn't put my hand up even when I knew the answers. Even in English, which is my best subject. I've always got ticks and stars and very goods all over the place for my stories. Miss Beckworth started a poetry lesson and it was actually quite interesting. And then she read this poem by some dippy American lady and you had to guess what it was about. Like a riddle. And no one knew. Jamie guessed it might be about a river and Miss Beckworth said it was a very good guess. But it was wrong. Huh. I knew what it was. Easy peasy, simple pimple. It was a train. And I sat there with this ple pleased feeling dropping through me, though I act all cool and bored. Slumped in my seat, arms folded, waiting. 
waiting until she was just about to give up and then I was going to put my hand up after all and maybe yawn a bit or fiddle with my hair and then I was going to do and I was going to go as a train. Like it must be obvious to everyone. One up to me and ya yeah, book sucks to Jamie. Think really hard, said Miss Beckwith. Can anyone guess? And she looked straight at me, almost as if she could see inside my head and looked and look at the train going puff 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 in my, around round my brain. I still waited. I waited just a fraction too long. Because she stopped looking at me and just as I was unfolding my arms ready to put my hand up, she said, It's a train and everyone else said, Oh a train, of course, I get it and Anthony and those of his elk scratched their heads and said you what and why is it a train and i hate this stop soppy poem stuff i drummed my fingers on the desk in irritation and muttered i knew it was a train jamie looked at me with those snooty eyebrows of his disappearing right up under his floppy fringle fringle oh sure he said sarcastically well, I wouldn't have believed me either, but I did know, so I felt even less like joining in now, and I drew trains all over the back of my new school daughter, large looming trains about to mash and mangle small snobby boys tied to the railway, railway tracks. Then, I, then we had to write our own poem about trains. I can usually write poems quite quickly. So I did a silly one first on a piece of paper torn out of my jotter. Puff, 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 can't stand this stuff. All about trains, it gave me pains. Price pain to me is Jamie E. Help! Miss B is a bore. Her train dreams a chore. Want to sit with my friend? I'm going round the bend. I feel so blue. Choo, choo, choo. I folded it up and put to Angela and Lisa pass it on and then quickly passed it on myself while Miss Beckworth had was turned. It got about halfway across the class. Miss Beckworth looked up at the wrong woman. Uh oh Ah, said Miss Beckworth, pouncing. Someone has written a poem already, and they're so proud of it they want to pass it around the whole class. She glanced at it. Who is the author of this little the the little rhyme, hmm? I put my hand up. I had to. Half the class were crowding round to look at me already. I thought I might be in that trouble. Miss Beckworth was such a funny old-fashioned teacher. I didn't know what she might do to punish you. Maybe she had a cane tucked up her skirt and she'd whip it out and whack me one. But all she did was crumble up my poem and say, I don't think this is quite Emily Dickinson standard, Charlotte. Now write me a proper poem, please. I decided she maybe wasn't such a bad old stick after all, so I tried hard with my poem. I decided to be a dip, bit, bit different. I choose to write about a tube, because they're underground trains, aren't they? And it was all about the dark and the tunnels and how that weird voice that says, Mind the gap, could be the voice of Eternal monster. Jamie peered rudely on over my shoulder. You're writing rubbish, he sneered. Yours is the real rubbish, I snapped back, reading his pathetic twee twiddle about the train going through the rain. In the midst of the sto storm, the train will keep you warm. Yuck. But when Miss Beckworth walked round the class to see what we'd written so far she said he'd made a good attempt and do you know what she said of my she said about my poem try to stick to the subject Charlotte. that was it told you you were writing rubbish said jamie so i put down my pen and didn't write another word i had angela and lisa and all the other girls in hester in hysterics and the clock rooms after lunch doing my Miss Backworth imitation. Even back in class, I just had to put my front teeth over my bottom lip 
to have all the girls in giggles. Settle down, please," said Miss Beckwith sharply. "Now history. I thought this term we do the Victorians. I ask, I ask you, who wants to, to study the stuffy old Victorians? Well, guess. Jamie teaches pet Edwards. Miss Beckwith began telling us about the Victorians, starting off with Queen Victoria herself, that fat little witty queen, wad wadly queen. With a putting face, who said, "We are not amused." Well, I wasn't amused either, especially when Miss Beckwith started on about the Queen Vic, Vic pub down the road and all and Arbert Park, and how she lived in these old Victorian mansion flats. And did any of us live in a Victorian home by any chance? I slumped to one side with. The boredom of all this, just the, all this, just as Sammy stuck his head up so violently, violent, violently, I very nearly got two fingers impaled up my nostrils. I live in a Victorian house, Victorian house, Miss Beckworth," he said, showing off like mad, "an Oxford terrace." I sat up straight. I knew he was right, little pot, posh knob. But I had no idea he lived in one of those huge grand houses in Oxford Terrace, old steps and little lion statues, and incy wincy balconies, balconies, as if the people who lived there might come and do a royal family and wave down at you. Oxford Terrace is on our way home to, on our way home from our town, from the town. Sometimes we do. Sometimes when Joe and I are trailing back with our Sainsbury, Sainsbury bags, cutting grooves in our hands, we make up stuff, and we sometimes play. We live in Oxford Terrace, and we are, and we are Lady Joe and Lady Charlie, and we have champagne for breakfast, and we go for a workout in a posh club every day, and then we have a light lunch someplace. Snobby, and then we shop until we drop, going flash, flash, flash with our credit cards, and then we eat out and go dancing in nightclubs and chat of film stars, and rock stars and football players. But we just tease them and then jump into our personal stretch limousine, limousine, and whiz home to our five-story, half-million mini palace in Oxford Terrace. You live in Oxford Terrace, I said. Even Miss Beckworth seemed surprised. Do you live in a flat there, James? No, we've got the whole house, said Jamie airily. Well, perhaps you can help us understand what life was like in a big Victorian house, James. Miss Beckworth rummaged amongst a whole box of books about the Victorians. She pounced on something about Victorian houses and held up a picture of a Victorian parlor. I don't suppose your house looks much like this inside, though, James. Actually, my mom and dad have this real thing about the Victorians, and they've tried to make the house as authentic as possible. So we've got stuff like William Morris wallpaper and arts and crafts tiles, though we've got ordinary modern things like televisions and computers and stuff. I felt I was sitting next to little Lord Fauntleroy. Lord, he carried on in the sickening fashion for ages until eventually even Miss Beckworth got tired of it. Thank you very much, James. If anyone wants to know more about Victorian houses, then you are obviously a mine of information. Information. Now we'll be studying the Victorians. But I want you all power. to work on your own special project at home too. I groaned. I hate home projects. You don't sound ultra enthusiastic, Charlotte," said Miss Beckworth. "Well, I don't know what to do. I don't know anything about the Victorians. Not like some people," I said, glaring at Jamie. I'll copy a whole lot of suggestions for topics on the board. See if you can get your fancy defense, defective eyes to focus on them," said Miss Beckworth briskly. "It might be worth your while. I intend to award a prize for the best project at the end of term." So I copied out all her suggestions: home, food, toys and books, school work, the family courtship, Sunday law and order, seaside, Christmas. Boring, 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 boring. I didn't fancy any of them. Can we do more than one topic, Miss Beckworth? Said you know who. Can we do them all if we want? 
Yes, if you like," said Miss Beckwith. It was quite sickening in his enthusiasm, grabbing all sorts of stuff from the book box. Though he's probably got his own private library in his Victoria mansion. Here, it's not fair. You're bagging all the best books," I said, trying to snatch at the at a book on Victorian hospitals that looked as if it might be promisingly gory. Okay, okay. Here's one specially for you," said Jamie, and he bungs me this book on Victorian domestic servants. Know your place," he goes. I was about to bash him on his big head with the servant book, but Miss Backworth got narky and told us to settle down and start the research for our projects with the books we had in our hands. So I was stuck with the servant book. I flipped through it furiously. And then stopped. There was a photo of this girl about my age. Age. She even looked a bit like me, skinny and pale. It was a black and white photo, so it was hard to make out if her hair was red, red too. It was a long, it was long like mine, but scraped, but scraped back tight behind her ears, with a little white cap crammed on top. She was surrounded by little kids, but they weren't her brothers and sisters. She was a nursery maid. She had to look after them. She was their servant. I was a bit stunned. I didn't know they used to have children as servants. I read a bit about these nursery maids and kitchen maids and housemaids. Housemaids. They had to work all day and into the and into the evening as well as as well for hardly hardly any money. Girls as young as eleven and twelve, no school, no play, no fun, just work, work, work. I decided I'd do a project on servants. I was all set to write quite a bit about it. Actually, I decided I'd show it, show that Jamie. But Joe was already at home when I got back from school, and she had such terrible, scary news. I forgot all about my servant project. I didn't remember until the next day when everyone was showing off their project books. Jamie had done ten whole, ten whole pages about school, and he'd stuck in this old photo of kids in rows in a Victorian classroom and got his mom to do some lines of special copper plate handwriting. I finished my school topic already, he boasted. So I whipped out an old exercise book and scribbled and scribbled out a page at playtime. I finished my school topic too," I said, sticking my tongue out at Jamie. School. My name is Lottie. I am eleven years old. I left school today. My teacher, Miss Worth Beck, nearly cried when I told her I could not come back. She thinks the world of me. I am her most talented pupil. I am not being boastful. This is exactly what she said. Dear Lottie, you are the best at English and writing and arithmetic. You know your geography and history perfectly. You play the piano well. You paint beautifully, and you sing like a lark. There, I am also useful to Miss Worthbeck, because she is the only teacher at our school, and she has to control a class of forty mixed infants and twelve of us older pupils. I am not the eldest by any means. There is one great lad of fourteen, Edward James, but he is very slow. He is a head taller. Than Miss Beth worth back, and she finds it hard to control this boy. In fact, many of the boys are great lumaks, stupid and shrewd. Miss Worth back has to use her cane on them to keep them in order. I don't need to resort to the cane when I am left in charge of the boys, though I take delight in swishing it in front of them. But I usually instruct the little ones, and they all try hard for me. And give me apples and bites of their gingerbread and scratch. I love Lottie on their slates. Miss Worthback has always said I am a born teacher. She has always wanted me to stay on at the school until fourteen, and then she will give me a position as a pupil teacher, with a proper wage. But I cannot wait two years. I need to earn a proper wage immediately. Home. Joe and I haven't always had a home. We lived with Grandma and Grandpa at first. That was pretty bad. Grandma is the sort of lady who keeps a damn fennel 
flannel neatly folded in a plastic bag and she is forever whipping it out and smearing round imaginary sticky bits on me. Even at my age, that's nothing. She does it to Joe too. She doesn't do it to Grandpa because he's one of those pale men in strippy suits who don't ever get sticky. I can't imagine hanging on to his sharply crisp trousers or bouncing on his bony knees when I was a baby. Grandma and Grandpa didn't want Joe and me around, but we didn't have any place else to go. Then we got told about the Newborough estate and asked if we wanted a flat there. Grandma and my Grandpa just about died. You've probably not heard of the Newborough estate estate unless you live around here. You'll definitely have heard of it if you do. The police got get called out every night and the fire service because the kids kept setting fire to the rubbish in the chute. Chut. The ambulances are always there too because there are so many fights and people getting battered. Sometimes they come to scrape up the bodies because people throw themselves off the balconies because they're so fed up living in a dump like the neighbor's estate.